Lord, that is our prayer. Lord, that you would come and fall upon us. Lord God, that we could hear what you have for us, Lord God. We thank you for this morning and how beautiful it is. And Lord, we just pray that you would just be the center of our thoughts and of our, of our minds right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Wasn't worship great? I mean, man. That is probably like one of my top three favorite worship songs that we play for sure. That is like amazing, amazing, amazing song. Anyways, um, I have a story to start off with. And uh, some of you start laughing. Don't worry, it's not embarrassing myself too much. Actually, you know what? I'm going to start off with something different. I am going to tell the story. But so anyways, I've been on Jenny Craig and that's been going great. Uh, it's like 42 pounds down so far, right? <laughs> But I don't understand people, okay? I, I, I love everyone here. I love everyone in the 9 o'clock service, every service I have. I mean, I'm blessed to be up here. I'm humbled to be up here. But I don't understand sometimes what people say and, like, how they, they present their words to one another. And I, like I said, this couldn't have happened up until right now because it happened to me at the last service. But at 9 o'clock service, I'm sitting after, after the message, uh, you know, I'm sitting in the back just kind of, you know, I got one more to go. And so I'm, I'm up here doing my thing. A guy's like, hey, BJ, how you doing? I'm like, good. He's like, yeah, you've lost a lot of weight. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I used to be fat once. And I'm like, in what world is a backhanded compliment like that okay? And I got thinking about it. You know what it is? No one here, like, you couldn't do that in the world. You couldn't walk up to someone, you know, in the grocery store and be like, hey, you lost some weight, you used to be fat, you know? Like, you can't do that because you're afraid you might get blasted in the face. Like, there's that warning. But here, there's not that because we love each other. And so I, that kind of spoke to me like, that guy feels comfortable enough to come up to me <laughs> and tell me that he used to be fat once. So and he's like, and what I always say is, I may have been fat, but you're ugly, and you can't, he's like, you can't fix that. I went on a diet. I'm like, oh, people, people, people. So, you know, <laughs> what a blessing. Okay. Um, no, but it, it, it's, it's fun. And you know what? I, I, I love, because it always gives me a story to say. So just know if you say something crazy to me sometime, I might share it up here. Anyways, uh, I'm very, very blessed because I, I got to do something yesterday that I haven't ever done before. I got to scatter ashes on a boat uh, for a family that I, I love dearly. It's the Erickson family. Felicia Erickson, her mom has passed away and um, she flew in from New Zealand and she, she set up this huge thing. And since Gerald was out of town, um, she said she'd love to have me do it. So I went out and, um, and I brought my wife with me and we went out and it was kind of crazy because like, keep in mind, I'm from Idaho, so I've never been on the ocean in a boat ever. And so I was like super worried about motion sickness because everyone's like, hey, have you ever been on a boat, boat, uh, boat before? And I was like, no, 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 no. And they're like, take a couple of these. I'm like, I don't know what these are, but I'll take some because they said that it'll, it's motion sickness stuff. So I was like, okay. And so I get on the boat and I didn't know what to expect, but boy, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced. And um, really, I mean, they, 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 we get on this like yacht that there was only five of us. And so the whole thing's for us. And we go out to the, you know, in the middle of the ocean and, and I get up talking to Captain Paul. Captain Paul's the guy steering and I'm like, hey, Captain, uh, is there going to be any animals or anything that we can see? And he's like, oh yeah, you know, we'll see like sea lions and, and things like that. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, what about a whale? Oh no, whale season's done. If you would have came here before Easter, you would have been able to see them and the next ones don't come out till whatever time. And I was like, oh, that's okay. So I went back down, I was talking to Felicia and she was like, you know, isn't this just peaceful? And I was like, yeah, this is very, very nice and I'm very blessed to be a part of it. And she said, yeah. She's like, I just wish right now that, you know, because she's, she's struggling with the, the loss of her mom and stuff. She's like, I just, I just was just wishing and kind of praying that, you know, we'd see a whale or something. And I was like, that's kind of weird. I just talked to him about it. And um, so I was like, you know what? I'm going to say a little prayer, right? I'm just going to say, Lord. And so I began to pray, Lord, I, I don't know why I'm even praying this. You know, I know that, you know, this is so small and so many different things. But I just, I would love to see a whale for Felicia. I'd love to have a whale here and just make this perfect for her. She flew all the way from New Zealand to honor her mother. And it would just be amazing to see a whale. And so... Um, we're sitting there and 
you know, and we're doing the service. And by the way, it is like the most peaceful uh, scattering of ashes in the ocean. It's the most peaceful thing I've ever seen because the water turns like a teal when the ashes go in and there's flowers floating and all this other stuff. And, and uh, as we're sitting there, there, there's a song playing, a real peaceful song in the background. And, and uh, we're just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm sitting and consoling the family and they're, they're, you know, crying and laughing and they're, you know, doing their thing. And then all of a sudden here comes a whale, just full blow hole, everything just, psh, you know, we're like, I'm like, yeah, Lord, that's awesome. Here comes another whale, psh, two whales. I was like, wow, that is amazing. And Captain Paul up here is going, I've never seen this before in 25 years. He's like, we're, cause we, he's like 30 feet. We were only 30, I was only 30 feet deep. He's like, I've never seen him in this shallow of water. We'd have to go out like to a hundred feet deep to actually hit. And he's like, he's like, I've never seen this before. And I was like, Lord, thank you. 25 years this man has been on a boat and he's never seen that. And uh, God definitely received the glory. Felicia just kept going, praise God. He is the creator of all things. He is the one that speaks to every animal, to every person. And he's just like sitting there up top because he you know, wasn't saved. And he's just sitting there looking at us. And she's like, he is in control of everything. And I, I got thinking about it on the way back and I talked to Audrey. I was like, can you just picture God's timing. I mean, how could anyone else say that that wasn't God? Because, I mean, he's never seen it before in his life. And if we were five minutes before, five minutes after, we would have missed it. It was all God's timing to right after we dumped the ashes as we're watching the flowers go out to watch just whales and the whales doing their show. And I was like, praise God. And they followed alongside of us. It was really crazy. And um, man, those things are massive. Anyways, um, but super, super blessed. And I just want you guys to know that just starting off with like a little, I guess, devotional, that God cares about everything. I mean, it, just because you feel like it's not big enough or, you know, God doesn't care. Listen, God cares about the small things as well. God cares about anything that affects you. He loves you. You are adopted by him. You are a child of God. And what bothers you and what you want is something that God wants to give you. And so I want to in, just encourage us. You know, we have been going through the book of First John, okay? Uh, the last time I was up here, uh, we were going through First John, and so far, John has been writing to, th- to these believers uh, in Rome who were, who were being encouraged to go back to what they used to believe. We had them, some of them encouraged to go back to paganism. Some of them were encouraged to go back to Judaism. All of them being encouraged to get away from their belief and their faith in Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, he's been giving us some foundational truths and some other things that, 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 that all believers should know, including the believers at that time. But the last time we talked, he was giving us some serious warnings about things that were coming. And basically, he had mentioned that there was a group of people that came out from them, but were not of them, right? People that were claiming to be followers of Christ, people that were claiming to be disciples, but what they were speaking wasn't true. And they were speaking against the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is God, But the thing we left off on was amazing because we didn't leave you on the fact that these people were coming. We were leaving you on the fact that there's encouragement because uh, John says to us, he says that I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and there is no lie in the truth. He was writing to them and he's writing to you today. If anyone tells you that you don't have enough than just this, that you don't have enough than what the Lord has shown you, then you look at them and call them a liar because God says you know the truth as believers, that Jesus Christ died for you and paid a debt that you would never be able to pay back. That is the truth. And in doing so, he also gives us his Holy Spirit who teaches us and guides us and an anointing, he says, right? And, and you know, it's so crazy because we're here and I'm teaching you. And what I'm saying to you, if this is the only teaching you're getting the whole week, you are, you are a feeble Christian. Like, you are weak. If this is the only Bible reading you do, because God should be teaching you every single day as you go before him and read the word. He should be showing you. He should be speaking directly to your heart. The the only reason we gather here is because this is a time of celebration, a time of joy, a time of believers sharpening one another, praying for one another, lifting each other up, a time to, to sit back and hear someone teach. That's what this is about. This is not about the, you know, it, it's so funny that, that people sometimes think if they just come on Sundays and Wednesdays, that's enough word for the whole week. And I encourage you to go home and read because God will teach you and guide you in the truth. 
And as we, as we go into chapter three, he is going to continue to remind us of things that every believer should know and hold on to. A truth that every single one of you needs to remind yourself here today. And listen, I've heard this taught my whole life, but it's something that we need to be reminded of today. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter three. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love that the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has, been yet been revealed, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when uh, he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he was born of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for this time. We thank you for the word, Lord God, that we are studying right now. These verses, Lord, as we begin to chew on them, as we begin to eat your word, Lord God, that you would just let it just work in our body, Lord God, that we could be living and pleasing to you. Lord, we thank you for this adoption, Lord, that we're hearing about, Lord. And for some of us, it might be the first time, but Lord, for those of us that know you, Lord God, I pray that there's just that reminder, Lord God, that you love us and that you have adopted us as children. Lord God, we pray against anything that wants to come against this message today, Lord God. Lord, any distraction, Lord, any, any, anything at all, Lord God, that it leaves in Jesus' name. And this would be a time of spirit speaking to spirit, Lord, believers with one another, Lord. Lord, this is, this is tremendously terrifying for the enemy. Lord, so far, three services full of people ready to pursue you and nothing more. Lord God, ready to focus on you, surrendering this time. And so, Lord, I just pray this would be a time, not one that we sit on our cell phones or talk to the person next to, it, next to us, but a time that we grow. Lord, a time that we live. Lord Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, fall upon us, Lord. I'm not one to think that these words are anything without you. And Lord, as I prayed and as I studied, Lord God, and I, and I prayed, Lord God, that this would be the time that you would speak, Lord. You have already for two services, Lord, show up again. Lord, we have trust and faith that you're going to teach us here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse one says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Man, out of all the studies I've done, out of all the times I have stood before you, I don't know if I can start with a more joyful thing than what was just said to you. What amazing way to start our Sunday morning study that it's so exciting that John even put an exclamation point. He was excited while writing it. That the, What love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. A love that is undeserved. A love that there's nothing that you could do to ever make him love you. There's nothing you could ever give him to make him love you. And this is something that every single one of you as believers in here need to know today. The key for a, for a healthy walk with the Lord is first realizing that you are adopted and that you belong to Him. This is the number one key that you need to continue to remind yourself. It's going to affect the walk of your life with the Lord for the rest of your life the minute we begin to understand what this adoption really means. Go ahead and turn with me to Galatians chapter four, verses four through seven. We're going to spend a little bit of time there. It's another time in the word that speaks of this adoption that we have been adopted to and and this, this idea of adoption. And it begins to explain it in a little bit more. Galatians chapter four, verses four through seven says, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit 
of a son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Once again, we see Jesus, through Jesus, we have been adopted, right? Through sons, and we are sons and daughters of God, right? We've been told that we are adopted sons and daughters, but notice the word that he used there. He didn't say sons and daughters, did he? He said, you are sons of God. It was a masculine term, right? Do you guys understand why he did that? Paul knew what he was doing when he wrote that. There's a reason he didn't say sons and daughters because at that time, adoption was completely different as it was for a son than, was, than what it was for a daughter. And the people he was writing to would completely understand what he was saying. He's saying that we have the same rights, the same privileges as a natural born son. You know, this would not be the case at all while adopting a daughter. You, they wouldn't get the same exact stuff. But we, um, <clears throat> uh, but basically, as being adopted as a son, we receive a full rights of name, with full rights of citizenship, inheritance, everything that comes with adopting, we would get. Right? He knew that when writing to these people. And it's the same way that they would understand what it means to be adopted. They would understand what it means to be the adopter. They would understand what that means for God who's saying that he's adopting you in this room today. They would understand how amazing that is because we need to look at the roles of the adopter of that time as well. The father would have to have full authority of the son. The father who was adopting would have full responsibility to take care and to provide the needs of the person that they were adopting. You have to realize that today, believer, as God has chosen you today, that he understands that he is fully responsible for taking care of you, fully responsible with providing you with what you need as you are adopted to him. And I'll tell you one thing, that God isn't just going to give up on you one day. And if today you have been walking away from the Lord and you have been doing your own thing, I'm telling you that God has not given up on you. He can't just give you back. He can't just say, oh, I'm done with you, like, like so many people would. Listen, it's not like how I adopted this dog named Max, okay? I adopted Max, Max the bulldog. I adopted him. Basically, uh, Anthony and Jen Baker had this bulldog, and I put this thing out on Facebook, and I said, I'm looking for a dog. And all these people were like, I have a dog that you can have. And I'm like, ah. Uh. And then this other person's like, I got a dog you can have. And then, uh, you know, just tons of people were sending me links and all these great things of this dog. Well, finally, Gabe Hammett um, was talking to Anthony Baker. And Anthony Baker was like, I've got an American bulldog. And I was like, that's what I'm looking for. And I, I can't lie. I want an American bulldog because I think they look cool. Like, that was the main, that was my main drive was to walk around with a dog with a spike collar and look cool. Like, that was... <laughs> I'm not lying. Like, that was it. Like, that was, that was my thought behind an American bulldog. Um, and so basically, I, I go and see this dog, and me and Audrey are like, oh, the dog's so beautiful. And yeah, I knew he was crazy, and like, he was like jumping all over me. And then, then like, then yeah, seriously, like, <laughs> Anthony would just look at him, and the dog would be like, you know, like, he knew who his owner was. But for me, he was like, I don't know who you are, and I don't really care. And so it's jumping all over me, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take this dog home. He's like, hey, you can have it. And I'm like, um... I'm going to take it home and I'm going to adopt it. But if, if I want to bring it back, can I? He's like, absolutely. So I'm like, okay, great. So we like put the dog in the car and me and Audrey are trying to convince ourselves this is a good idea. And uh, we get him into the car and we get him home and we let him out and we let him in our house and we let him sniff rooms and these different things. And we're kind of looking at each other like, well, here we go. You know, we got this dog and you know, 20 minutes later, his tail's knocking things over and he's slobbering everywhere and there's fur everywhere. And we're like, oh, hello, is Anthony there? You know, like we tried calling to get rid of him after 20 minutes and they happened to go to sleep, right? So they were in bed as we were like trying to get rid of this dog. And we're like, we're going to have this dog all through the night as we were like huddled into this corner. No, uh, no. Uh, so we had this dog and it was so funny that the next morning we, cause we were tired, right? We, you know, we both have been working all day and Audrey's been working all day and so we're both like emotionally and physically tired. And then uh, we're like, we'll give it another shot in the morning. And so we wake up and the dog's being good now and everything's kind of simmered down. Well, we put him outside. He digs a hole out and just starts running around my neighborhood. And he looks like a pit bull. And so I'm like, can you imagine the neighbors and how much they hate me right now? Um, so I run out and grab the dog and I bring it back. But you know what's so funny about the way that I did that is just, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't adopt this dog. And you know what we think about, I think it's hard for us to quite grasp the adoption that God God gives us because 
we tend to think that we have to do something or he'll give us back. Or if, if, we're, if we do good, he likes us. And if we don't do good, he doesn't like us. It's, that makes, that's a sad Jesus and that's a happy Jesus. And it's just not right. Do you guys understand that? Because God loves you. He adopted you. You belong to him. In Romans 8, 14 through 17, the video that we watched, these are the same verses. For as many as led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the bondage uh, again to fear, but uh, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You know, adoption is, is is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. This is not foster home with God. This is God adopting us. You know, and I, I, look, at, I look at some of my friends and I uh, look at Jeff Brady, you know, and he's adopted, right? I remember when I first came here, like, it, I was here for a couple of years before I found out he was adopted because he looks, acts, talks just like his parents, right? You know, and that's, that was my thing. And I know people in here that have adopted their kid and there's not one minute they're like, well, that's not actually my kid, right? That is absolutely your child and that's the way God treats you. That there's nothing you can do that's going to keep him from loving you. It's a wonderful thing. You know, with, with, with birth, you know, man, whatever comes out, you, you got to love it, right? <laughs> you got to love it. And you got to love it through its teenage years as well. So, um, but that's what's so special about adoption. You can pick everything. You, 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 can, you can take it and you can pick. And just think that God chose you today. God has been pursuing you today. And if you're here and you're not saved, God is tearing at your heart today. He is pursuing you. He has chosen you with all your issues, with all your doubts, with all your struggles, with you having absolutely nothing to offer him. He has chosen you here today. He understands what that means. He takes full responsibility of you. He loves you. I want you guys to say it with me in here, that I am a son of God. God. Say it again. I want you guys to do that next time Satan comes to you and says that you've done too much. You've done too much to, to have God continue to love you. Or next time you have a situation in your life and you're like, Lord, I don't know how I'm gonna get through it. I want you to look at that situation. I want you to look whatever's lying to you and say, I am a son or a daughter of God. Stop telling me anything else because the minute that you realize that you are a son and daughter of God and you keep your eyes focused on that fact is the minute that you begin to walk in a way that's strong and you have this freedom in in, in a walk with the Lord. But as you begin to walk with the Lord, as you begin to, to do this, you begin to resemble Jesus, don't you? Right? Because that's who you're looking at. Treating others like he did. Focusing on them. Loving others like he did. Focusing on God and what he has for us. You know, listen, Gerald always in my life tells me, and whenever he mentions me from the pulpit, he always says, BJ is a spitting image of his father. Right? And I understand it a little bit. I look like him, you know, but it's one of those things that I never compare myself to him because I've always looked up to him so much. But when Gerald says that I'm a spitting image of my dad, it's because I have seen my dad for 24 years be a, a, a character of a godly man, a, a man who loved his family, and, I, and it's everything I've always wanted to be. So I become to look like him, and it makes sense because I looked up to him. Are we doing the same thing with Jesus here today? Because of what Jesus did, you were adopted. You belong to him. Are you looking to Jesus as the, the number one example in your life? Listen, it says in, in verses two through three, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what shall we be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You know, we know in our life, and you've heard it spoken many times, that our life is one that changes every day, every year, as we begin to look more and more like Christ. Right? I mean, even the term Christian means little Christ. It means that we are trying to look like Christ. Today, is that your goal? I love what that video said. Not focusing on who you were, not focusing on how jacked up you are, but how do you get to look like Jesus? Are you, today, are you looking like Jesus? And Romans 8, 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might uh, be the firstborn among many brethren. Our walk will never become complete, but it's one that should be having, being marked with progress in the Lord. 
will never be complete. Listen, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now in part, uh, now in part, but then I shall know just as I also am. Philippians 3, 20 through 21 says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. Our life should be marked as one who's so in love with this God who loves you more than anything that our life begins to change radically. It is God's love that changes lives. It's God's love that brings people to him. And listen, when you have new believers, and there there could be new believers in here, but one thing that new believers always hear is this, right? You know, a lot of times it's like, read your Bible and pray every day, right? We all hear that. And it's, it's absolute truth, but for new believers, a lot of times, what do they say? They say, read your Bible, maybe start in one of the Gospels. You guys ever heard a pastor do that? Maybe start Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Listen, on to every man answer all the time. That's what they do. They suggest, you know, hey, start with one of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why do they suggest to people to start there and not at the very beginning? Well, I think the reason that a lot of people suggest to start in one of the gospels is so you can see who Jesus is and you can fall more and more and more in love with this person. Have you ever noticed how opposite it is with humans? The more you focus on humans, the more greatly disappointed you become, right? But with Jesus, all you look at is you see him defending the weak. You see him dying for sinners. You see him speaking up against legalistic people. You see him providing needs, healing the sick, and never returning hate for hate. That's what you see when you see to Jesus. But more than that, you focus on any human. And the more you focus on him and the more you look at just, just, uh, just a person, and you get let down. And listen, I've been let down my whole life by people that I put in that Jesus position in my life. And my prayer for you guys, I pray that none of you would do that. Don't put someone in that, that thing, that ultimate holy spot that, oh, that person has attained it all because listen, that person is just a messed up sinner like you. You need Jesus. You need to look at Jesus and fall more in love with him. And listen, I know that happens at this church, okay? I know that happens at every church around the world that we have a senior shepherd. And listen, as far as people go, as far as human beings go, Gerald Hagerman is one of the coolest people I know. He's one of the most awesome, loving people I've ever known. But he cannot be Jesus for you, okay? Because you're gonna look at him and if he doesn't come up and talk to you, you're gonna be sad and you're gonna leave and then you're gonna post on Facebook about how you're mad at us because blah, 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 whatever it is. But that stuff comes, and people that do that are expecting so much out of one person that you, that you leave yourself ready to be let down, but God will never let you down. God will never let you down at all. Don't put your hope in anything else but him. And listen, it says that everyone that has hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. We have hope in Jesus. Our hope is Jesus because in him, is our hope, right? It's almost like a riddle, like everything about him. Our hope is in Jesus and our desire should be one that is focused on Jesus and one that is focused on walking pure because he gave his life for us and he walked pure. But in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, it says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. So do you get what I'm saying? As we follow Jesus, we begin to look more like him. We begin to tell other people, imitate me. You wanna know what a Christian looks like? It looks like this. I messed up, but I still love the Lord right? I want you to know that we are called to be witnesses and examples for one another. That's true, but never put them in that spot that they are the holiest thing in your life, okay? That, I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's the catch here. Like, put people in your life. Like, I'm surrounded by people I look up to spiritually. Oh my goodness. And if you're not, you need to find some people to surround yourself with that you look up to spiritually. Listen, I'm surrounded with people that have gone before me, that are fathers of the faith, and I put them all around me because there's so much to learn from them, but I never put them in the Jesus position because they will let me down. We have a wonderful example in Jesus anyway. So let's see in verses four through six what it says. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him, uh, sorry, has neither known him nor seen him. Um, 
you know, it's so funny because in 1 John verse 8, it says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, right? But now it's saying whoever abides in him does not sin. And so all these people that want to find a contradiction in the Bible, they're like, bingo, found one. One spot it's saying, if you have no sin, then you're a liar. And this one, it's saying that if whoever abides in him it does not sin. I mean, what is it talking about? Well, you got to look at the word commits, The word commits in verse four is everything. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin. In Jesus, there is no sin. Listen, this word commits is a word that means habitual, unrepentant, blatant sin. You know it's a sin. You could care less and you live your whole life focused on the fact that you could care less what God tells you to do and you're going to live your own life. That kind of living is not okay. Listen, understand there's a difference in committing a sin and continuing in sin. Two completely separate things. Man, for us as believers, we understand that we struggle with flesh, right? We understand that we're flesh and spirit. And right now as we have this body that that we were born into sin. And so there's sins that for some of us we're attracted to more than others. For some of you, maybe it's lying. For some of you, maybe it's drunkenness. For some of you, maybe, I don't know, whatever it is, lust, whatever it is gluttony, whatever it is. We are, we are pulled towards these things. And I'm telling you that that's going to happen our whole life. There's going to be that temptation that comes. But the more you walk with the Lord, the more that temptation goes away. Do you guys understand? Because you are being strengthened in the Lord. It doesn't ever go away. It doesn't ever go away for good. I mean, you're always going to have that struggle. Sometimes you're always going to be tempted in some way to do something because right now we're here and we're living our lives in this flesh. But, but if you mess up, you just come to the Lord whose grace is abounds in mercy all around you and you are forgiven and you just receive your forgiveness. That's all it is. God forgives you of any sin you're ever going to commit. God died on the cross for your sins. You belong to him. He loves you. He forgives you. It's as easy as that. However, that does not mean that we get to walk around and have no concern for how we live. Have no concern for what God has told us to do. These type of people that... that are not sorry. They don't seek forgiveness. It's no concern to them. You don't, you don't want to be a part of that second group. It says a lot of things about those people. And I know we started off with a message about being children of God. And right now I'm telling you, if this is your lifestyle, the one that I just mentioned, you need to repent. You need to repent and be clean. Let's focus on five and six a little bit here. It says, and you know that he was manifested. I underline that word, he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Jesus came to pay the debt that we had called sin, right? The only person that could pay this debt was Jesus because he was spotless. He was perfect. He was God. First, uh, first Peter uh, 1, 18 through 19 says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received tradition from your fathers, but with the, pre- with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish or spot. Do you guys understand today that Jesus came to do more than just cover your sins? Man, he came to take them away. He came to wash you clean completely. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Colossians 1, 19 through 20 says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell and be reconciled to him all things to himself. By him, whether the things on earth or in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Turn with me right now to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. This explains a lot of the difference between covering and uh, taking away sins. Hebrews 10, 1 through 15. It says in Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, 
He came into the world and he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the, in the, volume, of this, uh, in, in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, my, oh my God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, uh, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Now focus on this. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first so that he can establish the second. By that, will we have, uh, uh, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of a body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he, uh, after he had sacrificed, uh, sorry, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God. From the time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he is perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now, do you guys understand what it's saying? Back when they would just sacrifice animals, all that was doing was speaking of a time that one, of one that was greater would come and pay for it all. Basically writing some sort of like IOU. Like there was one coming that was going to pay for it all, and that's what you need. You as, you as unbelievers in here, that is what you need today. You need Jesus to pay that price for you. Because that's the only way to heaven. That's the only way to be adopted as a child of God. And for those of you that are children of God, you need to be reminded of this daily. You know, Easter service was so amazing, right? Wasn't Easter service just like one of the coolest times? Who here came to the, the sunrise service? Raise your hand. Wow, okay. Yeah, because it's, you know, it's, it's funny. 7.30 service, just about every person in the whole place raised their hand. I mean, they only got to wake up like an hour earlier. But the 9 o'clock service, it was down in the 10.40. You guys, man, you guys are on it. Anyways, it's amazing because we, we celebrate the fact that Jesus died, but man, we, we love the fact and celebrate the fact that he rose from the dead and that we don't only identify in his death, but we identify in his resurrection as well. Jesus just didn't die. He, was, he, he rose again. And we can identify with that life that he has. In verses 7 through 9, it says of First John, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, and I underline this in my Bible, the Son of God was manifested. Okay, we see this again. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So not only was he manifested to take away our sins, praise God, but he was manifested to destroy the works of Satan. Listen, for those of you that think that you have no sin, you do. You were born into it. Listen, the number two, I mean, the, 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 the number one thing that we had in our lives was Adam and Eve. That's the number one, the, the two people that walked with God in the coolness of the day. And listen, they messed up, they sinned. And so we are born into sin from that point on. You are born sinner. Just because you haven't murdered anyone or cheated on your wife does not mean that you are not a sinner, right? God goes to the heart. You see in the Beatitudes that Jesus starts going to people's hearts and it's like, man, if you even looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you're guilty. He goes on and tells a whole bunch of other things as well, but the fact is, is we were slaves of sin. We had no other option. We were born into it, but Jesus came. You know, Adam messed up. The first Adam messed up, but Jesus, the second Adam, came to stomp on the head of the serpent to give you guys freedom and power and, and for us to identify with that life that there is in Jesus. And Romans six nineteen through 23 says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves to sins, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then, uh, then in these things that, which you are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and in the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know we are not slaves per se of God, but we are children of God. 
Jesus came to destroy uh, this, this hold of death and evil and sin over our lives. He came to free us. And listen, as believers, your life should not be one marked with a lifelong, disobedient, and blatant, blatantly sinning lifestyle. Because you are no longer that person. That doesn't mean you're not going to mess up, but your life should not look like that. And I'll tell you why. Because there's not room for both of those things in your heart. God talks about having a lukewarm believer. Listen, there's, you see that he says, you're neither hot nor cold, I spew you out of my mouth. You're lukewarm, I spew you out of my mouth. And there's tons of other verses that say that. There's no such thing as kind of Christian. There's no such thing as, uh, you know, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian. And, you know, just by word only, listen. You either know Jesus or you don't. You either have Jesus or you don't. That's as real as it can get. And listen, for some of you guys in here, you guys were professionals at sinning, Right? You guys figured out how to get away with it. I mean, you guys had times where like you like, I mean, seriously, if there was like an Olympics of sinning, I'm sure that us in this room would, would, would win. I mean, I mean, because we are sinners and that's what he says. You presented your, your members as, as slaves of sin and that's basically what you did. But now as you've, as, as you've heard today, maybe if this is your first time hearing that you were adopted by God or if, or if you've heard it, but this is just a reminder, man, can, can't we put that same desire that we had to sin now that we have been freed from that to walk with the Lord, right? And also too, when you think about it, God doesn't just send you and go, here you go, don't sin anymore. He doesn't do that to us. He gives you all the tools that you need. He gives you the Holy Spirit who does everything for you. You spend time focusing on the Lord, the Holy Spirit will strengthen you. God himself dwells inside of you, convicting you, giving us the power you need to overcome sin. He hasn't abandoned you. It says in John 16, 7 through 15, this is Jesus speaking. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I did not go away, the helper would not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin, because they do not believe in me, of righteousness, because I go to my father and you see me no more, of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, um, he will speak and he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me for he will take, uh, he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the father have has are mine. Therefore I said, they, uh, uh, sorry, therefore I said they, th- he will take of mine and declare it to you. A little while and you will not see me. And again in a little while you will see me because I go to the Father in heaven. Luke eleven thirteen says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Man, as believers today, you have the Holy Spirit. He says, it's good for me to leave. It's good for me to go back because I'm sending my Holy Spirit. I'm sending the helper. I'm sending what you guys need. Do you understand that God today loves you as much as he loved Jesus? Let that blow your mind for a second. Do you guys understand today that the same Holy Spirit that lived in Jesus, (laughs) that, that let him live a perfect life, resides in every single one of you. Now your sinful lifestyle doesn't look quite so big. Now you can look at the enemy and say, get out of here. I'm a child of God. And see, sometimes we just need that reminder. Sometimes when life catches up with us, sometimes when problems catch up with us, sometimes when there's relationship issues catch up with us, sometimes when sin stacks up against us, you need a reminder. And the reminder is this. God lives inside of you. You are a child of God. And you can overcome anything. And that's how we want to leave this today. As I have the worship team come back up here, I want to leave this with you guys. Never forget this. Always remind yourself that you have been adopted, that you belong to God, that you're a son of God. 
And let this, the the idea that that you have been adopted, change your life and resemble him completely. Praise him for taking away our sins. Praise him for destroying the works of the enemy. Praise him for destroying Satan. No matter what he wants to do to say that you still belong to me, you do not belong to him anymore. He came to destroy that. Let this motivate you that he has given you the tools to succeed, not to live a life that is marked with disobedience. I get very leery around people that have no concern for how they're living. Because I know in my heart there's something, you know, as much as the song kind of drives me crazy, He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion, you know? And it's so true, though. People that have the Holy Spirit, that have God living inside of them, it's convicting them and guiding them and moving them. And I'm always a little bit nervous when somebody, you know, just does not care how they're living at all. You've got to ask, where is your relationship with the Lord? You belong to him. Today, if in this room, maybe you have just... You know, listen, it doesn't, doesn't mean that if you have a doubt or right now you have sin that, you know, God has given up on you. I told you that he can't give you back, right? He adopted you. You belong to him. But I am saying that why not just get our hearts right before the Lord, right? So let's just go ahead and pray. And I want this message, once again, just to encourage you to go out into wherever you go, whether it be work, whether it be school, just wherever you're at in life, and let the fact that you're a child of God dictate everything you do in the rest of your life. Let you love that person at work that hates you. Let you you speak truth and love to that person that despises you. Let you be an example of what's going on inside of your heart. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for just your mercy and your grace. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have chosen me, Lord God, that you've chosen each and every one of us. Lord, right now, I just give you, Lord, everything. Lord, I I, I pray for forgiveness of my sins. Lord, and I thank you, Lord, that I can come to you so boldly, knowing, Lord God, that you will forgive me. Lord, I pray for people in this room, Lord God, that maybe have become complacent with their lifestyle of sin. Lord, it may be that you're beginning to speak to their heart that 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 closet that they have in their heart that's closed and they feel like they can hold on to it, it needs to go. Lord, we need to be consumed by you right now. So Lord Jesus, let your love for us move us, Lord God. Let it it spark just something inside of us that we can tell everyone we know about what you've done and how much you love us, Lord God. It's going to be your love. It's the same gospel message that's changed lives for years and that will continue to change. It is your power. It is your love. It is your grace towards us that will change us. Lord Jesus, show us your love and your grace right now. Overwhelm our hearts with your presence. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for just everything that you've done, the completed work on the cross, that there's nothing that I can do that makes you, you know, that makes you not love me. Thank you for an undeserved, unconditional adoption into your family, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.